This story is something that I think about from time to time, and it creeps me out. Two, almost three years ago, I was 17 years old at this point. I was accustomed to being in horrible situations, as all I had was my mother, and she could not hold down a job for long because she had her own issues to tackle. And so as I grew up, we are in and out of friends' houses. We never really had a place to stay except twice, but that didn't last long either and we would be forced into a new environment with a snap of a finger. So, when I was 17, we're led into a situation where we're going to be homeless again, and I was used to it at this point, as I'd slept in the street more than I'd like. The day comes when we have to leave our house, and my mom is able to stay at her boyfriend's trailer. I had nowhere to go, as I had no friends at this point. I stopped my friendships because they were bad for my health and mental state, and overall, they were toxic. My mom gave me the option to go with her, but I didn't want to, as I felt like I'd be getting between my mom and her boyfriend. Plus, I'm used to the street, and I didn't think it was as bad as it was at the time. So here we are. I get dropped off at a McDonald's, and I eat some burgers before I go off into the streets once more. Eventually, the sun fled, and darkness was all that remained and so I look for a place to sleep for the night. I went into many places that night trying to sleep, but none of them were working because it was either too hot or the lights were too bright or the mosquitoes were biting me. That's when I remember a house that I used to go into to chill in. This house was under construction and nearly finished, so the doors all shut and the windows were all settled, so there were no mosquitoes. I go through the back like always, and I make my way upstairs. Eventually I settle in the bathroom, because there's less debris on the floor. So I lay there, and I try to sleep. I then hear some sounds downstairs, and I don't think anything of it. I figured it was the door that I came through, swinging open and close or something. Eventually, after laying there for maybe an hour, I open up my phone, and I look at the old photos of my life thinking about how messed up it was that it got to this point and how I lost everything. The noises were still happening this entire time, but I paid no mind to it. Eventually, for whatever reason, I get up and I go to sit down on the back porch because I just couldn't sleep. I make my way downstairs and out the back door to the porch. I'm messing around on my phone for maybe five minutes when it happens. I see movement to my left from the back door I just exited from. I glance over, and time itself freezes. At first, I think that it's an illusion, but I was in fact wrong. I see a man, shrouded in darkness, peering past the wall inside to gaze at me. His lower half of his figure was behind the wall entirely, and I could not see anything but his upper body. The rest of his body was leaning to the left, peeking behind this wall, almost like the man was trying not to let me see his full body, as it would make his presence known. The man was a pure black silhouette, and I could not make out any features. After noticing him, I just sat there and stared at him for what seemed like forever, but it was probably only a minute or two. I expected him to come outside and talk to me, because I normally talk to a lot of homeless people, and I thought the man was just homeless. He didn't come outside though. He had not moved at all actually. He was as still as a statue, quiet as a mouse. Maybe if I had not noticed him, he would have stared at me the entire time. After staring at him for a bit, I got up and got my bicycle and made my way off of the property. As I'm walking out of the backyard, I peer into the window that's next to the door I saw the man in. The moonlight revealed the man was still there. Only now he was watching me walk off of the property. I could tell because the moonlight revealed the top of the man's head, and I saw his left eye gazing at me. He was a white male who was very tall and had a jacket of some kind on. I couldn't make out any more details because he was cloaked in darkness. After seeing this, I just move a little faster to get out of there. I get to the front of the house on the street, and I looked inside to see if I could see him again. 
I could not. I got on my bicycle and waved goodbye to the house because I figured the man was still watching me. I then rode on. For the rest of that night, I couldn't sleep. I tried two different spots, but both were no luck. This is where the story ends. I know I didn't have any crazy chase or fight to the death or anything, but this was real life, and it's not the same as movies or books. I don't know what the man was doing in there. I assume he was trying to sleep like I was, but the way he was staring at me was very unnerving. It makes me wonder how long the man was in the house for, and what would have happened if I actually fell asleep in there. Would he have stared at me while I was asleep, completely blind to his presence? Or did he have other intentions? I will never know, but now I don't go into houses like that anymore at all, after this experience. So, to the man shrouded in darkness, let's not meet again. When I was a teenager, like 13 or 14 years old, one of my mates from school lived in a kind of rural area. It's hard to describe. We lived in the suburbs, but his area was a little further out and less suburban looking at the time. This was 25 years ago. It was kind of suburbs, but hilly and surrounded by forest. I went to his place to stay from time to time because there was always adventures to be had around his place. One day, he mentions that there are caves near his house, old mine shafts, to be more precise. They were in a kind of national park. I was super interested to go check them out with him, so we planned to go the following weekend, and I'd stay up the night before, so we could set out early the next morning. The weekend came around, and we set out around 8 a.m. We went to the supermarket on the way to stock up on drinks and snacks and made our way to the caves. The national park was huge and beautiful. It was a great morning for a hike too. Not too hot and not too cold, with a nice blue skyed sunny day. We came to our first cave in the first 20 minutes of hiking. We grabbed our torches, or flashlights, and went in. It was only short, ending in a small chamber. At the far end of the chamber was a sturdy, locked cage type gate. My friend told me some were locked off due to the very real chance of cave-ins or flooding on the lower levels. Since the cave wasn't too long, it wasn't too dark. With a small amount of sunlight coming in from the entryway, we took a break and sat and ate some snacks. It was good being out and about. I was never a fan of early mornings, but this was an exception. We resumed our trip after that short break and came across several more similar caves. There were a few longer ones with evidence of people using them for underage drinking. Candles and beer cans coupled with shitty teenage graffiti. But these were an exception and not too bad. For the most part, people seemed to respect the caves to an extent and cleaned up after themselves. After about an hour and a half, we came across one that was a bit different from the others. It was a longer one, but evidence of people using it for anything was minimal. I was too embarrassed to say so at the time, but I got a really weird feeling when we entered it. It was weird because we had been in so many and I felt nothing, but this, this just made me feel uneasy. I looked at my mate and he seemed fine, so I didn't say anything, not wanting to appear soft. When we got to the end, where the metal gate was, we found that it was unlocked and open. In fact, when we got closer, the wind seemed to blow it open slightly, although I didn't feel any wind. I got a chill up my spine and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It was like something was inviting us in. Without hesitating, my mate was like, let's go. I was a little taken aback. How could he not be picking up on the bad vibes here? But I ended up not saying anything, thinking maybe I was just being paranoid and didn't want him hassling me later about it. 
I regret this now. So, in we went. It was so dark in there. Our flashlights barely lit a couple of meters ahead of us. The tunnel seemed to go on and on. There was zero evidence of anyone having been there. What do you think we'll find? My friend whispered to me. Don't know. I managed to mumble out. Anis was really starting to hit me now, to the point that I was beginning to feel nauseous. And then, it got worse. I felt wind start to blow around my ankles. At first I paid it no mind, but then I thought, where is this sudden wind coming from? The temperature seemed to get colder at each step too. Then, I felt the wind brush past my shoulder and face. My heart was beating so hard that I imagined it was echoing in the tunnel. Then, I started hearing whispering all around me. It was faint and hard to work out the words. I stopped in my tracks and listened. When I stopped, it seemed to stop too. And then the most bone chilling sound I had ever heard could be heard in the distance in front of us. Low at first, but deafeningly loud in no time. It was the bellowing scream of man. One at first, but then I could make out multiple voices. I felt what felt like hands start to grab at me, and I could take it no more. I took off in a sprint, back towards the exit. I could only half see the way because my hand that was holding the flashlight was pumping up and down so hard as it does when you sprint. I scraped my arms, legs and shoulder against the rough rock walls several times, but I didn't care. It felt like I was running endlessly, but eventually, I reached the gate which I collided into. I thought it would be open, but for some reason it was shut. In my panic, I couldn't seem to work out how to open it. Eventually, I managed, and it swung towards me, and I left. My friend, not far behind me. We finally got out and kept running, until we realized we were out. Upon realizing this, we collapsed into an exhausted heap struggling to regain our breath. I'm not proud of this, but I also vomited on myself due to the overexertion. It was my only shirt for that weekend too, and I had to borrow one of my mates while we cleaned up mine in secret, because for some reason, we thought we'd be in trouble. Just before we got up and left the area where we collapsed, I took one look back at the cave. It was kind of involuntary. I wasn't even thinking about it. When my eyes landed on the cave entrance. I swear I could see a shadowy figure standing in the darkness, staring at us. I shot a look at my mate, and he saw it too. I was this close to puking again, but I managed to hold it down. We got up and hurriedly left the area. That was enough adventure for one day. We went back there a year or so later, for nostalgia's sake. We also felt bigger and tougher. That particular cave was heavily locked off, with no trespassing signs on it, threatening hefty fines. Probably for the best thinking back. Teenage bravado makes young boys do stupid things sometimes, and we may not have escaped so easily a second time. Recently, I've been getting more into cosplaying and going to conventions. I've been making all my own clothes for a while now, but only recently decided to really start getting into it. I've been to a handful of conventions over the year, and this is the first bad experience I've had. Anyway, for this convention, I wore my Supergirl cosplay. I made and patterned it myself, and overall, I was pretty happy with how it came out. A handful of people asked me for pictures, and generally I said yes. Well, later into the convention, my friends left, but I was going to meet up with some other friends later that night. So I took a break from walking around, and sat in one of the hallways where there was a small seating area. Someone walked up to me and asked me for a picture. I said sure, and stood up to pose. He then said, entirely unprompted, Thank you for being one of the few cosplayers that actually has the physique to pull off that cosplay. I said, 
Excuse me? And decided I no longer wanted to take a picture with him. So while he rambled and tried to backpedal, I picked up my bag and just started to walk away. He then proceeded to grab me and physically try and block me from leaving. I shoved him off, shouting, Do not touch me, and walked away. He was shouting after me. I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying. I just told him not to touch me again and walked off. I didn't get the chance to report him then since I just wanted to get away as quickly as possible. But about 15 minutes later, I was on my way to meet with the other friends I mentioned previously, and I saw him again. Of course I immediately made a beeline for the nearest staff member so I could report him. I looked over my shoulder and he was doing that ominous Kubrick stare, very much giving, I think I'm an edgy anime protagonist vibes. I explain what happened to a staff member. He starts walking towards me. When I finish telling the story, he's standing about five feet from me and starts saying, what I meant was that most cosplayers are overweight, and I cut him off and walked away because my friends were waiting for me. Like dude, I know that was what you meant the first time, that's why I thought you were an asshole, and that his first reaction was to try and defend himself again and not profusely apologize for grabbing me when I was trying to get away from him. Anyway, later that night, I followed up with Conops. They told me they talked to him, and it put him on watch lists and said, I'm not saying this is an excuse, but he explained that he was autistic and didn't actually mean harm. I said that the harm was still done, and he made me feel incredibly unsafe, and the con ops person said she would work on getting him banned from the weekend, but not the convention as a whole. I only went to that convention on Friday, since I had to work Saturday and Sunday, so I'm not sure if anything happened after that. This happened when I was in university. My university wasn't in the same town or state that I lived in, so I couldn't commute. I wasn't exactly rich either, so I began the difficult hunt for a cheap apartment. I went to view an apartment which was in my price range. I was really hoping to get it, because I couldn't find anything else quite as cheap as that apartment in that area. I felt like I was onto a winner. I was a little apprehensive, but it was the only place I could afford. When I was shown the apartment, it was, as described, pretty old and dingy. Not amazing, but not terrible. One thing I noticed that was strange was that the bathroom door seemed new. Its paint wasn't as faded as the rest of the paint in the apartment. I asked the landlord about it, and he said that they had to change the door because sometimes it got stuck and it wouldn't open. Fair enough, I thought. The first three months flew by without incident, and I was enjoying my own space. That all ended when one night I woke up in the dead of night to hear a scratching sound. I went to go and check for the cause of that sound. I turned on the light and I got out of bed, but then the scratching suddenly stopped. That spooked me a bit, but since it stopped and I was tired, I just ignored it turned out the light and went back to bed. The next day I was watching TV in the afternoon and I heard the scratching again. I pressed the mute button and waited. There was the scratching again. I stomped on the floor and the scratching stopped. It sounded like it could be cockroaches or some bug. Thinking back on it, I realized how wrong I was. It was a very strange sound. I heard that noise every day from then on. It was never at the same time. The scratching came in random intervals. I started to spend more and more time out of my apartment because of this. I guessed that those noises were probably still occurring even when there was no one home. One night when I was in the apartment, the noise was so awful it really got to me. It woke me up in the middle of the night. Another sound began to accompany the scratching sound. It was a gurgling. Whatever was making it seemed to be either frightened or stressed. 
I got out of bed and began to search for the cause of these creepy noises. Something deep down told me to leave it and go in search of it in the morning. I was now more than a bit freaked out. When morning came the next day, I got up as usual and I started watching TV. I know, I was a hard-working student, as you can tell, huh? I was thinking at this point that I had an infestation in my apartment. I heard the noise and I shot to my feet. It was coming from the bathroom. It was like something was scratching at the bathroom door. I banged on the door, hoping it would stop, like the stomp had stopped it before, but this time I was wrong. I knocked on the door, and then the scratching changed to a scuffling kind of tapping. I smacked my palm on the door, and it didn't stop. The tapping continued. I didn't like it at all. The tapping grew louder to a banging sound. The thudding on the inside of the door was making the door swell with impact and vibrating through the floor. I knew that it wasn't any infestation. I knew, I knew that there was no one on the other side of that door too. Usually there was no one in the apartment building during the day except me and the landlord. I stood there frozen. I was worried that the landlord was going to come up to my apartment and shout at me for the noise. And then it suddenly stopped abruptly. I had to check. I didn't want to, but I needed to know if there was someone there. I opened the door, as slowly as I could. I was bracing myself for whatever was going to happen next. I saw long scratches and dents on the other side of the door. I was really scared, and I couldn't stand being alone in my apartment, so I headed down to the landlord's apartment, and when he answered the door, I blurted out what had just happened. He didn't seem that phased, and the reason for this was revealed. It was as if he had heard my story time and time again. He followed me upstairs so I could show him the scratches. He sighed, and then told me about a former resident. According to the landlord, there was a woman who tried to take her own life by using a poisonous gas in the bathroom. Apparently, during her attempt, she changed her mind and tried to get out of the bathroom. Like the landlord explained at the start of this story, the old bathroom door sometimes didn't open and it got stuck. She couldn't get out. The police's suspicion is that the young woman began to kick and bang her fists against the door to try and get the attention of anyone nearby. Sadly, she was unable to escape. And even if someone happened by, they wouldn't have been able to get inside because her front door was locked. In her final moments, however long or short they were, she must have dropped to her knees and then fell forward onto her stomach. She scratched at the door, leaving marks like the ones I saw that day. The sound I had been hearing was maybe the sound of her scratching. The landlord then said, Look, I have a lot of tenants in here, and I, I tell them the same thing when they realize that an accident happened in here. I mean, I probably should have told you, hey, sorry. Look, the thing is, when you hear the scratch and show her that you noticed and are aware of it, she always stops. Same with the banging. I mean, I can paint over the scratch marks if you want. No charge. How about that? I was so angry. He should have told me this before moving in. This wasn't a joke to me. I told him that I was out of there. I went upstairs to get my things. I threw as much as I could into a suitcase and burst out onto the streets. I am now completely free of all mysterious phenomenon. But I often think about that poor woman and the noises I heard in that apartment. This was about four or five years ago. Back then, I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was a part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and sold off. So we did have neighbors, though they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that because of the privacy, 
It wasn't like there was nobody nearby I could go to if I needed help. That thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 to 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, and after this incident, I never walked after 6 p.m. ever again, always making sure there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would have also been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm. And it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. It was late at night. I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Help. It was this monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my earphones out and turned my music off to make sure I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded, because for some reason, my first instinct was, Oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, then my brain kicked in, and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do, so I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran forward and grabbed her. I then turned around and bolted back towards the house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice, as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there, and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase. I was so fucking terrified that whole time. The image of someone cloaked in shadows chasing me entered my mind, and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. It doesn't end there, though. Despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really had needed help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location. Another very stupid decision, considering what we found. That being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of our car, though. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid. We drove home, having seen nothing and no one. But it still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us over again, and we searched the immediate area. Nothing. No indication that anyone had been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for. But I know shock can leave you eerily calm which could have explained the voice and the lack of response afterwards, and that made me fear we'd been too late and we'd find a body in the morning. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, because at least then I would have had a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, and to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep. Kidnappers, serial killers, all the classic horror stories. But I guess I'll never really know for sure.
I have a pretty disturbing story to share. It all starts in December of 1993. I was living in Aurora at the time. It was around 9pm and I had just finished my martial arts class and was waiting outside for my mum to pick me up from the school. My martial arts school was in a smaller shopping centre near a well-travelled intersection on the west end of Aurora near Denver. Adjacent to my school in the same parking lot was a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. It usually closed around the time my class got out, but occasionally some of us would go and play video games or get breadsticks while we waited for class to begin. This particular evening it wasn't terribly cold. It was mid-December, but the winters in Colorado can be somewhat mild. I was still pumped from class, and I was running around the parking lot with another one of the kids from my class. We were distracted, so we did not see the figure enter Chuck E. Cheese. It was the loud popping noise coming from the building that got our attention. Before we could grasp what was happening, a kid came running out of the restaurant with a gun in his hand. He practically ran right into us. The next thing I know, he's pointing it at my face. He just stood there for a minute. It was like time froze. I could not take my eyes off the barrel, and all I could think of was this was probably the last thing I wanted to see in the world. After what seemed like a long time, but was probably a few seconds, I looked past the gun at his face. He wasn't even looking at me, he looked scared. I can see his finger on the trigger, and wasn't sure if he was going to pull it or not. I was frozen, and could not have stopped him if he was. Instead, he turned and ran without a word. I watched him go, glued to the ground, amazed that I was still alive. He took off around the side of the building and was gone. My classmate and I just sat on the pavement. Neither of us said anything. Eventually, my mum showed up to give me a ride. I'm sure she was curious why I was acting funny, but I could not bring myself to tell her what happened. As far as I know, she still doesn't know to this day. I did not sleep that night. The next morning I heard people in school talking about what happened. The kid's name was Nathan Dunlap. He murdered four people I know personally in cold blood and critically wounded another. He had ditched the gun in an attempt to escape. That led to his arrest and eventual conviction. He was to be executed earlier this year for the crime but was given a stay by the governor of Colorado. Having known that he had killed those people, I believe he would have killed us too. I'm not sure what distracted him that night, but I'm grateful. My family knows I was there that night. I don't think they know the extent of my involvement. I was never questioned about it, and until now, have never really volunteered any information about it at all. But I am now, because some things you learn to let go of. I don't know how much you know about him or what he did, but for a recap, the kids he killed were my age at the time. I didn't find out the extent of what he did until the next day, when I was face to face with him. At that time, I did not know he had just killed four people. He looked right at me, but I don't think he saw me. He looked more scared than I was, and I was the one with the gun in their face. I don't know if he should have gotten executed, he claims now that he has found God or whatever in prison, and that he's a different person. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it's not. It will never change the fact he executed four children in cold blood over nothing. He is where he belongs, and I'd almost rather see him have him live out the rest of his days reliving what he did, instead of getting the easy way out. I, a mid-twenties woman, was traveling solo through Europe for the month of March. I had the most incredible time, and overall felt extremely safe. There was just one encounter that felt so bizarre and honestly scary. It was around 10am in a mid-sized city in Germany on a Sunday. I just checked out of my hotel and was walking through the city center with my backpack on my way to the train station. Lots of people around waiting for the tram and walking, a really safe area. 
I noticed a woman standing in the middle of the street where the tram tracks were. She was wearing a backpack on her front, but not like a traveler's backpack, a smaller one. She looked maybe early 40s, wasn't disheveled, looked clean, was dressed appropriately for the weather, that kind of thing. Soon after I passed her, I heard her calling out in German and soon realized she was calling out to me. She was clearly not in distress or asking for help. She wanted to make conversation, and with many folks, I'd totally be down for that. But something about this person was instantly not sitting right with me. I ignored her at first, but she would not stop, so as I kept walking, I said, Sorry, I don't speak German. In hindsight, this was stupid, and later in my trip, I wouldn't have done it but I was still getting used to all of this. Oh, you want to speak American? She said. We can speak American. I ignored her, but soon became aware that she'd started following me. I picked up my pace and ducked into a crowded bakery, thinking either she wouldn't see, or at least I'd be around other people in a contained space. I ordered, but before I even sat, I saw her come in and order something too. I was pretty freaked out at this point. I sat down and put in my earbuds and opened a book, not actually listening to or reading anything, but hoping it would keep her from talking to me. No. She came over and sat at my table. I tried to ignore her, but again she was relentless, waving at me and smiling. I don't even know how to describe her smile. It was like, just really forced and unnatural like she was putting on some kind of act. I asked what she needed, and she told me that she'd seen me walking and thought I looked like I needed some compassion. I told her no, I was good, everything was fine, but thanks, trying to be as appeasing as possible while still making my disinterest clear. She kept smiling at me and asked if I had money and a place to stay. I told her yes, I was fine. She started talking about various things, people she'd met on trains, dance classes, whatever else. Her English was not great, so I didn't really understand a lot of it, but suffice it to say, these were all completely random topics. The really strange thing, though, is that I didn't get the impression that she had a mental illness or any kind of neurodivergence that would explain a conversation like this. It felt like she was just trying to think of ways to just keep talking to me. Like, at times, I could see the wheels turning in her head as she tried to come up with something, anything else to say. This went on for probably five minutes. Finally, she offered to move to her own table. I said yes, that would be great if she could. She sat at the closest one to me, but even then tried to get my attention and talk to me. She finally sort of stopped, but still kept looking back at me and pulling out her smartphone to text someone. Also, she never once touched the massive slice of cake that she'd bought at this bakery. There was one man, a fellow customer, sitting nearby who looked sympathetic to me and kept glancing over like he was suspicious of this woman and what was going on. But I don't think he spoke English, so he couldn't really understand and it's not like I could have explained it to him as I don't speak German. My heart was racing. Finally, I decided I needed to get out of there. I kept checking Google Maps to see when the next tram would arrive. There was a stop almost right outside, and once it was just a minute away, I slipped out of the bakery while the woman was looking down at her phone and ran onto the tram. I watched the doors the whole time to make sure she didn't follow me and didn't stop looking behind me until I was safe at the train station. I haven't been able to stop thinking about this, and I don't know what to make of it. I met tons of outgoing people in Europe, people much more direct and sociable than Americans, but no one else ever made me feel the way this woman did. Something about the whole situation, following me, buying something that she never ate just so she could come into the bakery, looking back at me and texting someone. It just felt so off. I believe I have pretty good instincts when it comes to people, and this person just didn't feel right from the beginning. 
I can't help but be afraid that she saw me with my backpack, quite obviously a tourist, and was planning on doing something to this naive and vulnerable American. I guess I'll never know, but I'm curious to hear if any of you have ideas, or if I'm just totally misreading a harmless situation. Thanks for listening. Years ago, man, I am old, but let's say mid-1990s, I worked as a woodland firefighter while in the Army Reserves. I worked as a spotter. Basically, I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was just as it sounds. I would use binoculars and look out for fire, smoke, and other telltale signs of fire. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from me. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on the lookout for anyone who might be having illegal fires, looking out for wildlife, and staying afoot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on, one week off. So we slept in the towers, cooked our food, etc. There were nearby toilets and showers for us as well. One day, I came across an illegal bear trap. I had several ranger friends and I set off the trap, then pick it up to take it to the ranger station on one of my treks out for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park, and carried a big fine even back then, and some jail time, but it did not stop the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back for my fire tower. We did have a rifle in the tower to be used in cases of emergencies. Just a few months back, a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly, so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars, but did not see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my coworker Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He hadn't heard anything today, but had came across a few traps himself. That night, after a dinner of frank beans and toast, I was writing to my future wife when I heard the rumbling of a truck. Thinking it may be Ben, occasionally he made the trek over. We would crack open a soda and chew the fat for a bit. Instead, I saw four men with rifles get out of the truck. One looked around and leaned up against the truck, while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed my rifle, my lantern, and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from a rural Virginia farming town, and even with one deployment behind me, I was naive. I should have called it into the rangers, but instead, I thought I could talk some sense into four dangerous men. I barely got a, hey, what are you doing? out of my mouth before I was roughly shoved by rough hands. My lantern fell and I heard it crack. The rifle was kicked away from me and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in the stomach. I barely caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men and was shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles, but in reality, it was probably only a mile. However, I noticed that there was no sounds. In the forest, it is rarely silent. It is a cacophony of sounds, even at night. Owls, the wolves, crickets, but on this night, nothing. Suddenly, I was shoved onto my knees and I felt hot tears well up. I thought of my parents, my little sister, my brother, and my fiance who were back home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun and shut my eyes, then prayed. Suddenly, the night erupted. However, it was the sounds of sirens those of the forest rangers, and behind them in his pickup, Ben, who had tried to radio me that he had heard a car's engine and came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were arrested. Ben drove me back to the tower. I was still shaking. He didn't lay into me for not following procedure, just said, that was close kid. I ended up leaving the job months later to take a job closer to home, but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sent him a wedding invite and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. However, as time usually does, we lost track of one another and a few years back, I googled him. He would have been 75 or so and I discovered he had passed away a few years back. I don't know whatever came of those poachers, but I do know, I never want to meet them again.
there were these two guys that came into my work. It was normal until my co-worker pointed out that these two guys were staring at me very intensely. They were non-stop staring and even turning their heads to stare. They weren't even hiding it at all. The stare was very predatory-like and made me feel extremely uncomfortable. It was like they were watching my every move. Every time I would look in their direction, they would be staring at me. For context, I work at a restaurant and we have bottomless drinks. They ordered food and had eaten it, but kept on refilling their drinks, staying at the table for at least four hours, which is highly unusual, as customers will typically spend 45 minutes on average or less, as we are sort of like a fast food restaurant. One guy was on his computer, the other was on his phone sometimes, but the majority of the time, they were just staring. They were barely talking to each other and were mostly silent. One of the guys left at some point, but the other one was still there until I had to clock out. The guy also asked me a few questions when he asked me for ice cream. That being where I'm from, because apparently I looked foreign to him and he asked if I came from Spain. It was pretty unusual. When I left the restaurant and I turned around, the guy was right behind me. I panicked and stopped. The guy walked past me and I walked in the opposite direction. I called my mom and got home safe. I'm nervous about this and I'm feeling very uncomfortable. Although nothing happened, I'm worried that I'll see them again. My gut feeling is telling me they had bad intentions. Ever since I was a kid, I remember my grandma denouncing horror of any kind. Ghoulish Halloween masks, haunted houses, scary movies. I had attributed this aversion to her background and faith. She is Hispanic and a devout Catholic. She believes anything horror related is wrong, evil, you name it. So imagine my shock and curiosity when my grandparents shared a bombshell. Back in 1974, my grandpa convinced my grandma to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This would be her first and last scary movie. The weekend after the movie, my grandpa, grandma, my then toddler aged mother, and my aunts and uncles decided to go horseback riding for the first time. Since everyone lived in Wisconsin, my family made the journey to a farm about two hours away. For the most part, everyone is in high spirits. Who can say no to a family adventure on a crisp autumn Wisconsin day? Despite the other's excitement, my grandmother is worried. Since she doesn't care for horses, she chooses to stay behind on her own with my mother. When my family arrives at the farm, it's three o'clock. According to my grandma, she watched everyone get saddled up and then slowly ride off into the tangle of trees. The guide leading my family called out that the ride would last less than two hours, mentioning different trails, the need for breaks, things of that nature. My grandma figures everyone will be back by five o'clock. She waits with my mother in the car, playing games, reading storybooks, and trying to silence her bubbling anxiety. Needless to say, five o'clock comes and goes. No sign of my family. By this time, my mother has fallen asleep, which leaves my grandma with no way to distract herself from her worries. Finally, when six o'clock rolls around, she calls out to the farmhand from her car window. No way she's leaving the safety of her vehicle. She demands to know why her family hasn't returned yet when five o'clock has long since passed. By now, darkness has begun bleeding into the Wisconsin sky. The farmhand assures her that everything is okay and that extra paths are taken throughout the ride. He tells her that her family should return soon. Now, keep in mind, this was well before cell phones were a thing. Also, a week before, she'd seen her first scary movie, and it had scared the shit out of her. At this point, 
My poor grandma feels like she's living out a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She tries to contain her worry and begins a hushed, fearful prayer until the flash of lightning that is soon followed by ear-splitting thunder. The noise wakes my mother, who starts to cry. My grandma must now not only ponder the frightening question of where her family went, but she also has a stressed, howling two-year-old to deal with. It is now reaching seven o'clock. The storm is growing more ferocious by the second. My grandma has to pee, and her bladder feels like it's going to explode. But between the roar of the storm and the images of crazed country maniacs plaguing her mind, she refuses to leave the vehicle. She plans in her head that if they aren't back by 7.30, She's going to leave and find the nearest gas station to phone for help. Again, no cell phones during these days. 7.30 comes. Her family hasn't come out of the woods. As she's scrambling around the car for the keys, she realizes my grandpa never gave them to her. The pound of a fist against her window shakes her from her whirlwind of panic. That panic amplifies by a million when she notices a sizable, brawny man peering in at her. He's wearing a jacket, and the hood covers his head. My grandma says that, by now, it felt like someone had pushed a button and sent the whole world into slow motion. Everything crawled by at a snail's pace. Why don't you and the little one come inside? The man yells. His words are authoritative and carry no hint of warmth. He isn't speaking from a place of concern. He's ordering my grandma into the farmhouse. All my grandma can do is shout, Where is my family? The man responds, gruffly. We're looking for them. My grandma orders him to call the police. The next words the man said made my grandma literally piss her pants. We don't need the police. As he turns to go back into his house, he says, You and the baby can come inside whenever you're ready. My grandma starts to sob, wholly convinced that her family has been brutally murdered, that she and her baby will be next. In the chaos of this moment, she hears someone calling her name, but because of the pitch black darkness and her profound fear, she knows that she must be hearing things. Then she hears her name again, this time even louder. Dora, help me! It's my grandpa's voice. When she realizes this, she puts my mom in the back seat, grabs the wooden baseball bat that my grandpa keeps under his seat, locks the doors, and exits the car. Keep calling my name. I can't see you, she cries. After what feels like an eternity, she follows my grandpa's voice to his location. When she gets to him, she realizes my grandpa needed help because he has guided my aunt across the high, rain-soaked grass. She hurt her ankle. They're both drenched from mud and rain and covered in scratches. The rest of my family is nowhere in sight. Before my grandma can assume the worst, she hears my uncle calling for my grandpa. One by one, everyone shuffles out of the wild woods and through the tall grass. Everyone is soaked in mud and injured in some capacity. Cuts, gashes, limping, unsteady, all shaken as well. When they finally make it back to their vehicles, the sounds of running engines and the flood of headlights get the attention of the man inside the farmhouse. The farmhouse door swings open and the brawny man comes to stand on the porch. With an amused chuckle, he draws. Oh, you all made it out of there. My grandpa shouts. That dumb asshole left us out there, never came back. All the man says in response is, I'll have to talk to him about that. You all can come inside. His freakishly flippant and joking attitude sinks into his words. He knows damn well they aren't going into that house. My grandma begs my grandpa to leave it and get them out of there. With that, my family tears out of there as fast as humanly possible. 
Once the family was back home and safe, my grandpa explained what had happened. During the ride, the guide led them deep into the woods to a creek where the horses stopped for a drink. As the horses rested, the guide told my family that he had to go do something and would be back in 20 minutes. My family thought this was strange, and my grandpa even anxiously joked, You're coming back, right? The guide simply gave a low chuckle and took off on his horse. Twenty minutes came and went, and the guide didn't return. My family continued to wait as they had no idea where to go. They could see the sky blackening above them. They would have to make it out on their own. As my family rode off, they tried to remember the path back to the farm. They wandered aimlessly. Eventually, rain started to fall. Pulsing lightning and the crash of thunder spooked the horses. Everyone but my grandpa was thrown off their horses. When my grandpa climbed off his horse to help the others, his own horse galloped away as well. From there, it was a nightmare trying to navigate the woods while wounded and roaming through a thick void of darkness. The only advice I can give you is this. If you're going to go horseback riding, you better make sure it doesn't become a horseback ride from hell. My dad's house is haunted as fuck, and I moved out when I was 15. One night I was visiting, my dad was asleep upstairs, and my brother and I were playing games. We hear a light knock at the door. I went to go answer it, and my brother told me not to. I figured it was a friend he didn't want to see. The knocking got louder, and went from the door to all the windows around the house. Just intense banging. I asked him who it was. He said it was our mom, and that freaked me out but the cameras outside were showing nothing. 30 minutes this went on, and it got so intense you could see the glass and doors shake. I ran outside, and then it stopped. That's not necessarily the creepiest, but it's one of the shorter stories. Taps comes to my dad's house every six months, and I haven't been there past dark in about 10 years. A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit family. I'd be there about a week, then we'd head to the coast for a week, then back home for another week. I totally needed this break. I just ended an on-again, off-again relationship. Like, seriously, one day on, the next off. It took seven months of putting up with it, because you're supposed to fight for what's important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said it was done. No more chances, no trying to work it out. Just done. So with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else surrounded by my family and begin putting myself back together. Got there, spent a couple of days sleeping, a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple of days in a safe place where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So, before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I'd kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be he and I, but it didn't really faze me that another person was there. We hung out for a while, and then I needed to head home because I had to take a backwoods rural route to get home or taking a different route that would add another 20 miles onto my trek. Being backwoods, I needed to be able to keep an eye out for deer. So, I said goodbye and told S.A. that if he was ever in my neck of the woods, look me up and we'd grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend and out the door I went. About halfway home, I got this weird queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. So I slowed way down and sure enough, there was a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out on the road. I couldn't shake the queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down to the main road 
because there were more places to stop. I seriously didn't want to stop in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched too many movies to make that mistake. So I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station and sit there for a couple of minutes trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale, and came back out to my vehicle, still unable to shake that queasy feeling. So I started to head home from the gas station and knew I didn't want to go straight home, so I drove around, taking this road or that road until that weird feeling started to go away. Then I went home, read for a bit, and went to sleep. Next day, everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks, trip is over. I'm still feeling a little bit fragile over the breakup, but that's all. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies and then work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew there was a lot and it would take time. So the next day, I'm going about my business and everything is cool as can be when picking through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out and not have to think too much on the activity since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day, my phone rings. I don't get a lot of calls, so I assume that there might be a family emergency that I needed to answer at ASAP. The area code of the caller, who is not in my contacts, is the same as my cousin, so I answered without a second thought. On the other end was SA, the acquaintance I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him be calling me, but I'm not thinking that anything is terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up and he said he was at the airport. I still find it a little odd, but I said, oh, that's cool, where are you going? He said that he'd already landed. Again, I'm distracted and really just want to get him off the phone so I could get back to my mental sidestep and zone out while my brain chugged away. So I said that I hoped he had a good time wherever he was. He said that he needed me to pick him up. What? Did you just say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. Pause there for a second. I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Even the tossed over the shoulder, look me up comment, was one of those polite things to say because you never actually plan on seeing them again. Unpause. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him I didn't feel a connection at all and couldn't believe that he would fly across country to see someone that he'd spent maybe two hours with. He said that I invited him when I said to look him up. I said, uh, no, that's just a polite thing to say to some random person that has made a very small impression on me. He said that he needed to find a way back home then, since I misled him. Misled him? What the fuck? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods had led him to think that was a basis for any sort of encounter that was meaningful? He said that he needed a place to stay until he could get the money for a plane ticket back. I said there were more than enough hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said he didn't have any money after buying the random one-way plane ticket. So at this stage, I'm flabbergasted, angry, and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved and said he could stay the night while he sorted shit out, but I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So I bring him back to my place, throw pillows and a blanket on the couch, and turn to head to my bedroom and he asks if he can sleep with me. I'm like, uh, no. Actually, no fucking way that is gonna happen. So, I point out that I have firearms and do not attempt to come in. Next day, I have to work. So, I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him that I had to work, but would check in on his progress because the next morning, I was dropping him off at departures regardless of whether he had a way back or not. Went to work. He blew up my phone all day. Wanted me to come back to my place for lunch. Told him no, I'm way too busy. I finally get home from work and I'm chuckling at a text that I got about my dog. 
And that's when I noticed that he rearranged everything. And by everything, I mean every room of the house has been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was normal to do anything that he did. Instead of answering, he asked me who I'd been talking to. I said that it really wasn't any of his business, but I had received a text from the guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. Color me shocked when he says that he doesn't want me to talk to that guy. No longer freaked, full force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed and leave nothing but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees, and I very calmly said to get his shit and I was calling a cab to take him to the airport because he's fucking psycho. Side note, full range has been achieved when it feels like the temperature drops and I speak very calmly. If I'm complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone, calm, and tilt my head to one side slightly, that is where I hit arctic level anger. So he, unaware of the environmental change that has occurred and that the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer and got my ex's phone number and they both agreed that I was just heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten into my computer because it's a full quote of a part of The Art of War by Sun Tzu and that he would have to have been the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers and it was obvious that was not the case. I told him he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So still yelling insults at me, he gathers his stuff and leaves. I used to get calls and texts from him. I'd block one and six more would pop up, but it eventually stopped. To this day, I have no idea nor interest in knowing where he's at or if he made it back. So, crazy dude who would hop on a plane with a one-way ticket based on a random polite comment, let's not meet again. A few years ago, a new hiking buddy climbed up a waterfall. He slipped on some pine needles at the top and fell 40 feet down onto rock. I was the first person there. There was blood pouring out of his head. He had a broken spine. His shin broke through the skin. He bit below his mouth and pretty much had a second one. It took an hour or two for medics to get to us and another two hours to use ropes to lift him out of the valley to a helicopter. Miraculously, he was out of the hospital after a few months and eventually regained full movement. All medical experts were shocked that he made a full recovery. It was the most traumatic event of my life by far. My dad told me about this incident that happened in the early 50s when he was just a kid. I am posting it as it was relayed to me. In the early 1950s, my father couldn't have been much older than five or six. He grew up on a large family farm that was fairly isolated. The nearest neighbor was a quarter mile away through rolling wooded hills. There was no electric service on the farm back in those days and they didn't get phones until the summer of 84 so they were effectively on their own. Grandpa had sent my uncle to the feed mill to collect payment for that year's harvest. He was told to get it in cash. My grandfather wanted to pay that year's taxes and then deposit the rest in the bank. My uncle brought the money home. That night around 2 a.m., they were awakened by a car parked on the property with its headlights aimed at the house. Grandpa rolled out of bed and crawled along the floor to his son's bedroom and woke up my uncle. In almost complete darkness, they ran down the stairs. My uncle exited through the back door and my grandfather went out the front. He threw open the door and ran outside so fast he pretty much leapt over the back steps and went to confront whoever was in the car. 
The driver of the car had already exited his vehicle and was approaching the house on foot. He saw my grandfather heading towards him, with my uncle close behind. He turned and hauled ass. He made it back to his car, and as he was trying to drive away, Grandpa was grabbing his steering wheel, trying to stop him. He managed to break loose, and my grandfather chased him for a short distance down the road, but he finally got away. At that point, my grandfather and my uncle noticed a second car at the end of the block, speeding away. The intruders managed to get away that night, and thankfully, no one was hurt. The next day, they reported what happened to the local sheriff. The sheriff told them to buy rifles, then said, If it happens again, you do what you have to do to defend yourselves. The next stop they made was to the hardware store to buy rifles, one for my uncle and the other for my grandfather. As far as my dad knows, there has never been a repeat of that incident, and the late night visitors were never caught. Here's a little insight into my mindset nowadays. This took place at least 60 years ago, more than 30 years before I was even born. And despite that, it has done more to form my views on self-reliance and home defense than any of the Supreme Court cases stating that the police have no duty to protect individuals. There were two occurrences in my life in the past year where I've had to call 911 Instead of talking to an operator, I received this automated voice message. All operators are currently busy. We sincerely hope that you don't die a horrible and painful death by the time we get to you. Thank you. Both my wife and my family have taught me that when things go sideways, you're essentially on your own for at least 15 minutes. My father's recounting in the incident also showed me that there is strength in numbers. Rather, it's people responding to a threat, or in a more modern context, the number of rounds in a magazine. Because you never really know what's going to happen, for better or worse. I used to walk my grandparents' dog when I visited, since they were too old to walk her for very long. Most of our walks were through the woods. The dog's name was Molly. So, Molly and I would always go for a long walk, maybe an hour or so. There was one clearing that I liked to visit deep in the woods since it had a lot of branching paths, and the clearing had moss that was firm enough to comfortably take a rest on. Anyway. We went down one of the less worn trails one evening. I remember it leading to a lot of pine trees, small hills, and a rubble pile near the end that served as a landmark. At some point, we must have taken a wrong turn since I didn't know where we were, and normally we would have passed the rubble heap by then. I stopped for a minute and looked around to figure out what to do next. The sun was low in the sky, there were pine trees as far as I could see, and it was quiet, too quiet. It occurred to me that the woods were never quiet, since it was in a neighborhood and there was always an animal or two walking around. It was summer, so there would have been at least one bird around. Being a lake town, there was also usually wind. After realizing that it was oddly quiet, I'd also realized that it felt like I was being watched. Being an underdeveloped 11-year-old, I didn't like that. To further my suspicion, Molly started to tug on her leash back the way we came. She never did that. Listening to my gut, I checked ahead of the trail one more time before going back the way I came, occasionally looking back. After a certain point, I started to hear rustling that wasn't coming from Molly and I, at which point we started running. I didn't stop running until we reached the clearing again, and the rustling stopped, too. I could hear the birds again, and the wind was also blowing. Molly and I walked back to the house at a normal pace, and everything was normal after that. On subsequent trips, I take that trail off the beaten path with family, 
in the hopes of figuring out how I got lost that day. But it was always a straight shot over hills and through the trees to the rubble pile. My friend usually didn't make eye contact with me while talking. I'm European, and when I was 16 years old, I attended a Catholic high school in the States. It was all new to me. Of course, there were so many things that I'd only seen in movies that amused me, some that weirded me out, and even some that annoyed me as well. I loved it though, and I always had a great spirit of adaptation. So within the first month I was there, I already had a great group of friends. It felt precisely like being in a movie sometimes, having lunch with the cool kids at the most popular table, lockers, emergency shooting simulations, football games, all new and exciting to me. Another new thing for me was having to change classes every hour. In the country where I'm from, you sit five hours in the same desk with the same people sitting in the same seats, while the professors alternate every hour. In fact, one of my favorite classes was English, mainly because it was the one my friends and peers attended the most. I was sitting next to this guy, who for privacy I'll refer to as Mark, who was very nice and friendly, despite being a bit of an introvert. Everyone knew him anyway. The school was small, and among peers we really hung out 100%, despite of course the differences. And he was no exception, despite not being the most charismatic of the school. It amazed me that whenever I talked to him, he never looked me in the eye. He would always look around, or at the ground, often moving his eyes very quickly. This fascinated me, and of course it didn't disturb me at all. I found it a way to combat shyness. So, no red flags. In short, a little month goes by since my arrival, and things were going very well. One morning, I sat down next to Mark. He was my deskmate, and we talked as usual. I asked him if he could let me copy the last part of the homework that I had not been able to do during study hall, and he accepted very kindly. The day goes on smoothly, and the next day, I noticed that Mark didn't come to school. A few days go by, and a rumor begins to circulate in the hallways that poor Mark, on his way home, has found his mother dead. But that's terrible, I thought. Such a good kid doesn't deserve as such a big trauma. No one does, in fact. Two weeks pass. The rumors, of course, continue to circulate, and we hear the most absurd theories. The mother was with her head in the oven. She committed suicide. She was attacked robbed, strangled, in short, a great series of things that do not give peace to the poor lady who left us. I was very annoyed by this attitude, where things were treated like any other gossip. So Mark went back to school one day, and he was very sad. The gossip ceased, although in a low voice you could still hear commentaries, but we as friends in the senior year squeezed into his grief without crossing the line. I'm here for anything. I'm so sorry. My condolences. Come on, let's go out for lunch afterwards. And the usual things you say to a grieving friend. I've never been good at this stuff. So in English class, I put my arm around him and said a very simple, Yo, I heard. I'm sorry. And for the first time, looked me straight in the eye and thanked me. He was a different person. There was a darkness in his eyes that gave me goosebumps. He was sad, deeply, but it wasn't just sadness, it was almost despair. I thought, he's grieving, if this were to happen to me, I don't think I could ever recover, so I understood and respectfully left him to grieve. The next day, Mark is absent again. I keep thinking, that's normal, I wouldn't even be able to make it to school one day, I get it. And meanwhile, completely unrelated mind you. A man starts hanging around the cafeteria during lunchtime. I ask who he is. They tell me Ms. Lefeberg's husband. Fictional name, not just for privacy, but I can't remember what the hell the counselor's name was. The rumors around the school meanwhile continue to swirl. 
and I get really angry because this time they are really exaggerated. You have to show respect and stop even thinking such things, I told my friends. Another week goes by and the atmosphere at the school has literally turned to ice. From the speakers, the principal's voice calls all the seniors to the gym for communication. We go there, and next to Mr. Baghdad, again, same name problem, it's Miss Lefeberg's husband. This time, however, I hear his voice for the first time, and he tells us what we already knew. Mark killed his mother by choking her, although the idea had already formed in my mind. I felt the blood freeze in my veins. I didn't get the creeps simply because of the fact that an acquaintance of mine had the courage to kill his mother. I come from a fairly violent country. I have acquaintances in jail and others who, although free, have done some bad things, but never something like this. But because of the dynamics of things, Mr. Lefebvre, now I'm just assuming here that his wife took his last name began to tell us since he wasn't simply a guest in there, he was the town detective and was literally conducting investigations at the school, that things happened one morning. Mark asked his mother for the car keys to get to school, which she needed though, and after she refused, he jumped on her and strangled her. Then he came to school and sat next to me, gave me English homework, as if that was the main problem of the day, came home and called the police. The school also provided a psychologist, but no one consulted him. But in retrospect, I think a chat with him wouldn't have hurt. I was literally in an episode of 13 Reasons Why, five years before it even aired. In my school, in my country, dealing and fights happen quite often, so I thought I'd seen enough. Obviously, I was wrong. And every now and then I still think about Mark's deeply empty eye staring back at me. Keep in mind that I'm European. I guess for some unfortunate of you, this is nothing new or you've had far worse happen to you in high school. But this all happened within a month of moving into a world totally new to me. So yes, this is the creepiest encounter of my entire life. I was waiting for the trolley when a man came up to me. He was talking to himself quite loudly. He then walked over to me and asked if I thought he could unscrew the bolts on the train tracks with his teeth. He kept coming closer and asking me what time or train was coming, why I looked mad and sad, and other personal questions. I was scared, there was no one else around, and I'm a minor. He seemed unpredictable. He crouched down on the trolley tracks and shouted at me to let him know when the train was coming. As soon as he turned his back to me, I made a run for it. I snuck behind the trolley shelter and booked it. I was a bit shaken up, but nothing serious. I thought I lost him until he came around the corner, running towards me, screaming unintelligible words and throwing something. I didn't have my contacts in so I had no idea what he threw, but it hit something and made a loud, metallic bang. My stomach dropped immediately. I sprinted four blocks to the next trolley stop. I was hyperventilating the whole way there. I threw up in a trash can while waiting for my trolley. I would have gone home, but the stop he was at was way too close to my apartment. I sobbed the whole trolley ride but I successfully made it to therapy. I'm really hoping he's not there again on Friday. We loaded into Austin's truck, excited for filming our first paranormal video for our new YouTube channel. My brother Nick and I were horror junkies, and we've always had them. But that wasn't the only reason I was excited. I invited Stacy to come tag along as a joke, but surprisingly enough, she took me up on the offer. She was my crush since third grade, but we slowly had become good friends over the years. I could watch any horror movie, 
in a dark and empty basement, but asking out a girl terrified me. The ride situation required that me and my friends drove up in one vehicle, and Stacy and her friend drove up in another. Mason Manor was a mansion built on the East Mountain where an oil tycoon millionaire brutally killed his family, or that's how the story went. Mr. Mason was never found. This was 30 years ago, but many people speculate that he owed money to the mob or some secret government agency. But there was also another theory. The theory was that it was the spirit of the forest that surrounded the mansion that caused Mr. Mason to do what he did. It's hard to tell, especially with little evidence leading in either direction, and it being so long ago. Regardless of the case's rumors, many people think and have investigated the paranormal aspect that surrounds the home. If I could capture any proof of spirits or evidence that could lead in a break in the case, my YouTube channel will explode overnight. Thankfully, the manor was no longer protected by security, and was even left practically wide open for anyone to enter. The caveat to this, however, was that the mansion was out in the middle of the woods, and that if you entered the estate at night, the legend had it that you would soon become Mr. Mason's next victim. For our first video to go viral, it was a no-brainer that we had to enter at night. Austin drove the way up the long, twisted road that seemed to no longer be managed up the mountain and into the woods. I got a text from Stacy saying that she and her friend Bridget had arrived at the mansion way earlier than previously agreed on. It was 7 o'clock now, and we had another half hour drive before me and my friends would get there. The cool evening air became more brisk the further up we drove. Small flakes of snow began to get bigger. I was a little bit frustrated that she had gotten there before us. Not that it was a big deal or anything, but I was afraid that by the time we got there, that they would want to leave. Nick checked his camera that he had recently purchased online. A few hundred dollars was a small price to pay for internet fame. There was no doubt that this place was full of mystery and foul spirits roaming the halls. The three of us continued the drive until we finally reached the entrance to the estate. The circular driveway had a single car parked in it, letting me know that Stacy and her friend hadn't left yet. I sighed in relief and we parked behind her car. I texted her to let her know that we had gotten there, and we all exited Austin's truck. Snow began to fall freely now. We put on our jackets, figuring that this place was not going to be heated inside. I gave Stacy a quick call. It appeared that she answered, but no one talked. Hey, we're here. Where are you? No answer. Hello? The line went dead. I looked at my phone and saw that the reception was all but existing. Oh, lovely, I thought. Any word from your girlfriend? Nick teased. I gave a playful nudge. Yeah, I wish. Yeah, I can't seem to get a hold of her. We will have to find her inside. Austin perked up. She brought a friend, right? Do you know if she's cute? I shook my head. Hard for me to tell. I guess I'll just have to meet her. We got to the entrance and Nick began to film. I gave a brief rundown of the history of what had happened here and what we thought was going on. Nick gave me a thumbs up letting me know that we got a good intro and we went inside. Inside the mansion, leaves and pine needles covered some of the marble floor. The air was especially cold inside as it was outside, but the wind had died down. Hey, Stacy, we're here, I shouted, trying to notify her that we had arrived. For the briefest of moments, the thought of someone else being here had crossed my mind. If that was the case, then making my presence known seemed like a terrible idea, but I only saw her car outside. If anyone else was here, they then would have to be here by foot. Nick went off on his own and began filming sections of the estate while shining a flashlight in each room. My priority at the moment was to find Stacy, so we could start hanging out. The mansion was huge. Depending on which section of the estate they were in, there was a good chance that they wouldn't be able to hear us. I first checked all the rooms on the main floor. My flashlight shined in each shadow, causing darkness to flee as I peered into every room. I could hear Nick and Austin talking, and I made sure not to leave out of earshot. 
After about 20 minutes or so, the main level was clear. As annoyed as I was, I was also impressed. Investigating a haunted house at night with your friends was a huge plus for me, so I couldn't stay mad. I backtracked to Austin and Nick by following their voices. I found the two standing near the base of the large stairway leading up to the second floor. Austin was slightly grasping his stomach and I knew what that meant. Austin had always had an irritable stomach. It was inevitable that he was going to have to go to the bathroom on this trip, but at least now he had somewhere to go. You okay, man? I said while patting his shoulder. Yeah, I'm just not sure where to go. Well, you're going to have to go outside into the woods. This place's plumbing doesn't work. Austin slapped the railing. Man, I hate going outside. Can one of you guys come with me? Nick and I shared a moment of amusement. Dude, we're not going to go out there and watch you poop in the woods. You'll be fine. Ugh, it's just that I hate being alone in the dark, Austin whimpered. Nick handed him his nice flashlight. Here, take my light. It's like that I'm there with you, but hurry back. We have more filming that we need to do. Austin took the light and went outside. Poor guy, I said as I looked at Nick. We were anxious to get to filming, but I began to wonder where Stacy and her friend had gone to. I checked my phone again and still no service. We stood in the cold, dark mansion waiting for Austin to return, when we heard a sound that sent shivers down our spines. A muffled scream could be heard beneath us. Nick and I looked at each other. Did you hear that? I asked Nick. Nick had hearing issues all throughout his childhood and wore hearing devices to help him hear better. Nick looked at me. I did. Right then, as if on cue, someone else screamed again. This time, we both knew it was coming from the basement. The way Nick and I were raised, our first thought was that Stacy and her friend were not in any trouble, but rather, they had found the ghost that we were so anxious to find. Nick began recording, and he followed me as we looked for the stairway leading to the basement. The dark mansion didn't make it easy. We eventually found the stairs. The old worn wood creaked and popped as Nick and I quickly descended. For a second, I thought that the stairs were going to give, but thankfully, they didn't. Hoping to find Stacy in the source of what caused such terror, we frantically began to shout as we reached the bottom. Stacy, where are you guys? I shouted. Only I had a flashlight as Nick had given his to Austin. I could hear movement deep within the basement, but no verbal response to my cry. I tried again. Stacy! I shine my light around, only finding old furniture covered with blankets and tarps, filling the basement with eerie silhouettes and shadows. Much like upstairs, the basement was cold, but down here, it was especially damp. Dripping could be heard a good distance away, and an occasional puddle here and there. For the first time in a long time, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It wasn't the screaming that scared me so much, or the creepy basement but the fact that everything now was silent. Something was wrong, very wrong. If it wasn't for the fact that Stacy and her friend were here and parked outside, I would have thought that someone else was trying to lure us into the basement, or maybe they were. As much as I enjoyed horror and being afraid, my mind was telling me that I needed to leave. I could see how someone might be able to get lost out here, the basement was huge and with so many random things filled this rotten space. I looked at Nick, hoping he would be the voice of reason, telling me that we should leave, but he only stared at me. Where do you think they are? He whispered. His hushed tone scared me even more. I knew that he thought that perhaps there might be someone else down here other than Stacy and her friend. I shrugged my shoulders as I began to shiver from fear. I hesitated to talk or even move when a shuffle could be heard on the far side of the basement. I didn't think. I just reacted. I moved as quickly and as quietly as I could, hoping to find Stacy, or at the very least a familiar face. Before I could reach it, someone grabbed my leg from behind a piece of covered furniture and pulled me towards them. It was Bridget, one of Stacy's friends. 
I nearly jumped out of my skin and almost fell on top of her. Her eyes were wide and tears caused her makeup to run across her face, giving her a terrifying look. Her shirt was dirty and she sat on her knees in a crouched position, as if trying to remain concealed. He took her, she whispered. I knew that this couldn't have been a prank. A chill of terror shocked my spine as my body was now on high alert. Nick had the good sense to turn off the camera and crouch with us. What did she say? Nick said with a look of terror that matched Bridget. She said he took her, I repeated in a hushed tone. Who is he? I quietly asked. She shook her head. I don't know. We thought you guys were playing a prank on us and he lured us down here. He took both of us down even further, but I managed to escape this far. I paused and looked at Nick. What do you mean he took you down even further? Genuinely confused by this. He took us down this tunnel. There were cages. He tried to put me in a cage, but I managed to escape and scratch him. Stacy fought him off enough for me to escape. You have to believe me. She was frantic, clearly on the brink of a mental breakdown. We have to leave now while we still can. Please take me with you. Nick began helping her up, but I stayed still. Dude, you hurt her. We have to leave. I shook my head softly. I'm not leaving Stacy here alone with some freak. I have to try to help. Nick and Bridget looked at me as if I was crazy, and I probably was. There's no way you can take him on. There's something wrong with him. The man that took Stacy, he's, he's not normal. He's some kind of man thing. Bridget was trying to plead her case, making the culprit seem some kind of monster, but I figured this was only due to shock. I'll manage, I reassured, picking up a rusted pipe that laid on the ground near a pile of trash. How about this? I'll get Bridget back to her car and I'll come back for you. How does that sound? Nick reassured. Nick was never this brave but he was loyal. Loyalty was his fault. I knew that this terrified him much how I felt about this, but he knew that I wasn't gonna give up on the one girl that I'd ever cared about. He wasn't perfect, but he knew when to be a good brother. I nodded. Bridget took out her phone and turned on the flashlight and the two made their way out of the basement. I continued with the pipe in hand, looking for this tunnel. It took me longer than I thought, but sure enough, I found a hand-dug tunnel in the side of the basement. The tunnel had rough edges. Old frayed wires hung from the ceiling but no longer worked. The tunnel had a slight slope heading downwards. I looked into the dark abyss while shining my light inside, hoping to see anything to help me get her back. A pit in my stomach began to grow as my mind was screaming at me to not do this. But I was determined. Nothing was going to stop me. Not my mind, not some creepy guy that dug this tunnel. Nothing. I entered slowly, making sure I knew what was ahead of me. The tunnel was crudely made, but something about this made sense when Bridget referred to the man that took her as this thing. It was like some wild beast had burrowed its way down. The tunnel eventually turned, and a soft glow could be seen ahead. I tried to calm my breathing, but I felt like I couldn't get enough air. I could hear muffled sounds up ahead, and I knew I was about to come face to face with a real problem. My grip tightened on the pipe as I knew that I had to hit and hit hard, or else I would be the next victim. I turned the corner to see a candlelit opening in several cages inside. I could see a person in one of them. I silently shuffled over and saw that it was Stacy. Her hair was frayed and matted. Bruises covered her arm and small cuts could be seen on her face. She was staring in the opposite direction where the tunnel continued. I quickly walked over and put my finger to my lips, shushing her so as to not alarm whoever had done this. She saw me and her eyes widened. She then said something that almost stopped me in my tracks. Ryan, she whimpered. You have to get me out of here. He's going to eat me. I looked at the cage and saw that it was locked in place by an old rusted combination lock. I jiggled it a few times and quickly realized what I had to do. Two quick but loud hits caused the lock to explode into pieces, 
and I unlocked Stacy from her cage. A sound deep within the other tunnel began to grow louder, as I knew I had alerted the attacker. She quickly exited the cage and we made a break for it. She was slow, and I could tell that she had been injured causing her pace to be that of a quick walk. Whatever was behind us was surely going to catch us. I made a quick glance back before turning the corner and saw the gruesomest of creatures to have ever walked the earth. Whatever it was, it wasn't human, that was for sure. The height of the beast was unreal, so much so that it had to crawl on all fours to make its way through the tunnel. I couldn't make out much details aside from that it wore no clothes and it was incredibly pale. I shoved Stacy along, realizing that death was only a few paces behind us. We exited the tunnel and entered the basement. The beast's breath was right behind me. I turned to swing the pipe, but was met with an incredible amount of force, knocking me over and causing me to drop my flashlight. I fell into a pile of trash that made the landing hurt more than it should have. Thankfully, I still held on to my only weapon, as I was about to fight to my death. I was disoriented. I tried to stand, but quickly felt an icy grip grab my throat and squeeze the life out of me. I tried to swing the pipe, but it just bounced off the thing as if I'd hit a solid tree. My head began to feel light, as I knew that this was going to be the end. Two flashlights then appeared behind me, and I could feel the grip lighten slightly, as the creature was now distracted by someone else in the basement. The pressure then relieved entirely as Nick swung a small stool across the beast's face. Before the creature could react, Austin followed up with a solid swing from the pipe I had dropped, knocking over the creature. Nick and Austin continued their assault until the creature's head was no more than a pile of blood and bone. After a few seconds, I finally caught my breath. My neck was still on fire and I had to check to make sure I wasn't bleeding. The three of us stood over the beast's corpse, None of us had ever seen anything like this before. I thanked them, but they just stared at this horrific marvel that had no place in our world. Stacy then came up behind us. We need to leave. This isn't the thing that took me. It's still down there. The four of us sprinted out of the basement and out of the mansion. Naturally, we called the police, but the whole incident is another story. Since then, I'm no longer a fan of horror. I had left its mark on me in ways that I'll never be able to get over. Stacy and I stopped talking. We'd only remind each other of the nightmare that we'd had to go through. As for the thing in the basement, we haven't heard back from the police about whatever that thing was. But the thing that worried me the most about all this messed up stuff is that if the thing that attacked me wasn't the same thing that took Stacy, then what took Stacy? So a few years ago, I was on vacation in California for Disneyland. It was my girlfriend and I's follow-up vacation after the pandemic stopped us traveling in 2020. We had also brought along her younger sister with her high school friend. Now here's the thing. We all had lost someone in 2020. I lost my mother to untreated diabetic complications that she never recovered from. My girlfriend and her sister lost their grandmother after Thanksgiving due to a heart attack, and the friend who came along had her father pass as well from a long fight with cancer. With this in mind, I can tell you something touching yet paranormal. It was our last night, and we'd come from Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Now, during the trip, my roommates back home had asked me to bring back one thing only, California weed from a dispensary, definitely cheaper than back home. So while we were finishing our meal at GCM, the girls had agreed to go out of the way and visit a shop. A quick Google search showed one not too far from us, at most a 10 minute drive through side streets. What we didn't know was that these side streets were through some empty homeless camps under bridges and a boarded up industrial section with no street lights on. Mind you, we're in a rental minivan, so obviously we stood out as tourists. While following the GPS voice to the dispensary, we started talking about our dead relatives. 
all of them had lived in downtown LA during the 80s and 90s, so that's how the topic came up. My girlfriend's sister mentioned how unsafe the area looked, and we all agreed. The next thing we know, the GPS voice comes on and says, With me at your side, you will always be safe. We all went quiet at that moment, and the GPS had beeped and was redirecting our route. It made us take two or three turns, and suddenly we were back on a well-lit street with lots of people around. LA is like that. Cross a block or two, and you go from skid row to restaurants and shops. And this was my phone. I'd been using Google GPS as far back as 2012, and never once have I heard it say something anything like that. I still think about it. My girlfriend thinks it was the mentioning of them that made the GPS say that. I still think about that moment. It wasn't scary, but definitely wasn't something normal, given the circumstances. I graduated high school just after the economic collapse of 2008. The meltdown was catastrophic in the state where I reside, so I went from living poor at home to living in a true poverty on my own. Myself and a friend got an apartment in downtown Phoenix. He worked in retail, and I worked security for a department store. We both made less than minimum wage, just barely enough to cover the bills together. The apartment complex that we lived in wasn't just a dump. It should have been condemned. Our unit had a bare concrete floor, unpainted plaster walls, and you could see light around the frame of the door. Fortunately, we lived in the valley, so temperatures weren't a huge issue, but security was pretty much non-existent. The place wasn't just trashy. It was a common occurrence to hear fights going on in the middle of the night, or to come home to a building totally taped off and police officers everywhere. I'd heard about a guy getting stabbed in the alley just a few streets over. He limped back to the complex and called for an ambulance. Another time, there was a late night dispute at a party and one guest ended up shooting another. To say it was a colorful apartment complex with lots of wild neighbors was just an understatement. This place was legitimately dangerous at all hours for anyone from any walk of life. Even cops and gym rats were getting caught and beaten by street gangs and other violent offenders. We never really felt safe anywhere inside that neighborhood. I didn't even have a car to get around. I spent a lot of time walking or riding the bus, wherein I did my best to lay low and not catch any attention. All that being said, I grew up in the city and spent my time going to late night metal and rap shows at sketchy venues. I knew how to navigate seedy areas I had to de-escalate situations, and ultimately, I had to handle myself. I'd been in more than one physical altercation and always managed to walk away. My roommate and I were both potheads, so naturally, we came up with the idea of selling weed on the side for extra money. We both already worked full-time, to the point of extra hours every week, and would still come up short every month. In our heads, the logical move was to sell weed that we always had a stash of in the house. The idea was, we'd both be able to smoke for free and maybe kick up a little profit here and there. So that's what we did. We started with a half a pound, invested an entire month's rent to get it, and started flipping it immediately. We kept it real low profile, under the radar at all cost, because we did not have the means to protect this stash. Our front door barely even locked for Christ's sake. We definitely couldn't afford a gun. Frankly, I don't even think we wanted one. We never discussed the possibility of getting robbed or anything like that. This was just a side gig to make a little cash, not anything we wanted to get wrapped up in. By that logic, the only people we sold to were direct friends and family, co-workers, people we could trust, and hold accountable for anything that went awry. We weren't really huge party guys, maybe the occasional weekend turnout, but we mostly just chilled at home. We liked getting stoned and playing video games, watching movies, vaguely nerdy stuff. So this is what happened. I have to tell you in two parts because I wasn't there for the first half. I'd gone to work at my normal shift, but ended up having to stay late due to filing some last minute reports. 
While I was at work, my roommate, who we'll call Mike, got home and did his normal thing. Put on a pair of basketball shorts, grabbed a Pepsi from the fridge, and saddled up to the TV after smoking some weed. He'd play some solo campaign or whatever until I got home. Then we'd get online and team play or something. It was normal routine for our work week. Right around the time I was supposed to get home, the door handle jiggled. Mike didn't think anything of it. It jiggled a second time. This time my roommate hopped up and went to the door and actually opened it. Instead of finding me, he found a squad of gangbangers who pushed their way inside. Mike couldn't even scream before a hand is slapped over his mouth. He's ushered into the kitchen and then laid on the floor. At this point, I'm starting to wrap up my extra shift at work. I'm getting close to clocking out. There's a 40 minute bus ride between me and the break in going on at my house. Either way, we don't even know that it's happening, so it's not like I'm about to call the cops or get our buddies together. I just finish up and head to the bus stop like I normally did. Meanwhile, Mike is getting jammed up, badly. Three of these are holding him down, slapping the absolute hell out of him, demanding to know where all the valuables are. Behind them, the fourth guy is already starting to root around the living room. He's put our PS3, games, and controllers into a pillowcase. He's sizing up the flat screen, deciding if it's worth the trouble. Mike decides in this moment, he's not gonna go down without a fight. He struggles, shoves, spits, but it's no use. It just gets him in deeper water. A couple of these guys ring his bell, almost break his nose. The punches are so hard that his head is bouncing off the exposed concrete flooring. But still, Mike isn't out. His muscles flex against these guys out of instinct, not having any more in him. Two of them roll my roommate over, while the third ties his hands and feet with a pair of bootlaces. They were organized, well-practiced, and methodical and Mike knew he was outgunned, but for whatever reason, he still did not want to give up. He starts shouting for the neighbors to call the cops, call anybody, he's being robbed. One of the guys comes back and stuffs his own sock into the back of his throat, before going back to turning the place upside down. By now, I'm just getting off the bus, and I've started a short walk to the apartment. I've taken my headphones out because I don't want to stroll with music through the neighborhood. It just seems like the easiest way to get jumped. I avoid the alleyway shortcuts and just wander the main roads, which is the longest way. All the while Mike is getting his head bounced off the floor. I've always felt bad for the leisurely manner in which I went home. I enter the complex, make it to my building, ascend the exterior staircase to the second floor. I can see our unit. The door is closed, but behind the thin curtains of our front window, I can see two or three bodies hustling around. There is noise, but it's nothing that seems totally crazy. My first thought is to knock, but then I dismiss that immediately. It might be a shithole, but my name is on the lease. I twist the door handle. It's locked. I slip in the key and push open the door. Three big, shadowy ski mask goons turn to look at me. My first instinct is to bolt. It's as clear as day we're getting robbed. I don't even make it two feet before I feel a pair of hands snatch me up and then yank me back into the fluorescent hellscape that I call a home. The tour was horrific. Our TV is smashed to shit. The electronics have all been bagged up. Papers and mail scattered everywhere. Everything in the kitchen is on the floor. I remember all the silverware and broken glass just being shiny. I couldn't look away as they carried me down the hall. The hallway is like a bomb crater, holes punched in the drywall, clothes and random stuff scattered everywhere. I didn't resist as much as Mike did, so I just got hauled into the back bedroom, where I found my roommate face down. They'd hogtied him, he's thrashing like a crazy person against the bindings. I can see his wrist and ankles rub raw and are starting to bleed. They throw me on the ground next to him and roll me over. My hands get tied in a similar manner but I guess they ran out of court because they never bound my feet. They get me laced up and return to searching the place, but with what looks like a quickness. I got the vibe they weren't expecting me to just show up and now figured anything could happen, even cop interference. Mike turns to me, spits the sopping wet sock out of his mouth. He'd apparently been working on it for a while, 
but didn't have a reason as to they probably just stuff it back in. We're in his bedroom. It's already been ransacked. His video games are gone. Signed concert posters, even his mattress was flipped over. We gotta get these guys, is all he says to me. I shake my head. How the hell are we gonna do that? We need to call the cops. Mike nods to my laces and asks me if I can get free. Cautiously, I start to work the lace binding my wrist together. I'm staring down the hall, waiting for a shadow, any sign of someone coming back. I assume if they catch me trying to get out of the knot, it'll result in a savage beating, like they did on Mike. I don't want any part of that. I'm not a hero. I just want the situation to end as quickly as possible. But I do find that my knot is loose. After picking at it for only a minute, the whole thing unravels and I push myself to my feet. The adrenaline dump hits me. I fly over to Mike and start undoing his knots. These are much more tight and intricate. They take me much longer to pick at. It felt like almost an hour, but was probably closer to 10 minutes. I just laid there, still as could be, slowly clenching and unclenching his fists. Surprisingly, no one ever came to check on us. We could still hear them rooting around the living room and my bedroom. And the weirdest part, I didn't even care. None of it mattered. When I looked at the blood dripping from Mike's mouth and nose, or the rapidly bruising flesh around his eyes. There's a part about Mike that I've left out. He was a little older than me. He'd actually served in the army. He was a combat vet who'd been deployed to Afghanistan a year or two prior, while I was still in school. He was a bit of a wild card as he struggled with PTSD after coming home. Now, he was a combat crawling across the ravaged cement of his bedroom. It was totally crazy to watch as he disappeared into the folding doors of his closet and re-emerged with a baseball bat and an old military helmet on his head. A green steel one, like from World War II. The only thing he had on was one sock and those goddamn basketball shorts that he'd wear every day after work. I waited in the bedroom, out of pure fear, before finally glancing down the hall. It looked like the place had cleared out, except for Mike, who was stalking through the shadows with a bat lifted over his head, staring at something. Sure enough, one of the robbers steps out from the kitchen and into the hall, moving left to right. The front door is in front of him, maybe 10 feet or so, and Mike is closing in, mere steps away. The guy's back is to us. He's rummaging through a box of our stuff. Mike clocks the guy over the back of the head, and somehow, this guy weathers the blow. I mean, it was a full body blow to the back of the cranium with a steel bat. It was unbelievable to watch. The guy stumbles forward and then starts to recover. Before he can yell though and warn his buddies, Mike peels his helmet off and pitches it. This piece of steel hits the guy in the head, full tilt. He starches and then falls limp against the cement floor. Mike turns around and points at me, tells me to come sit on the guy he just knocked out cold. I was petrified, but slowly under Mike's encouragement, I crept out and put a knee on the guy's back. It didn't matter though. He was literally snoring on the ground. Mike tells me to check the guy for a cell phone, and if I could find one, call the police. Before I can reply, my roommate re-equips his helmet and charges out into the night after the remaining bandits. I turn back to the guy that's underneath me and shakily check his pockets. Lo and behold, I find a phone, two of them, mine and Mike's. He's also got our wallets and a little cash, which I pocket all of. I call the cops and let them know what's going on, and they actually arrive pretty quickly, well before the guy wakes up. As I said earlier, this apartment complex that we lived in was notorious for all kinds of crazy criminal activity. There was a squad car hovering around at all hours, it seemed. Mike returned just as they were loading the single guy into the car and taking a statement from me. Our apartment was absolutely destroyed, so everything was pretty obvious and I could actually point out the evidence to corroborate the story. They found all our weed and smoking material and stole all of it, so fortunately we didn't have to worry about catching any charges. We also failed to mention the extent to which Mike beat that guy. He didn't find any of the other men. They were loading our stuff into a getaway car the whole time, so when they were done, they were gone fast. They never caught them, and we never got our stuff back. 
and we weren't even able to move out of the complex as quickly as we wanted to. We did invest in a stronger door, a better lock, and always made sure to check before we unlocked it for anyone. We also stopped selling weed. As near as we could tell, those guys had heard from someone that we were a plug, so they decided to roll us. So let me start out by saying that I enjoy writing, though this is non-fiction, but it hopefully will be an interesting read. I also admit that I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story around three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like this. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loud, was literally whispering by the end of it, and she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and still do. I'm just glad I can't remember it too. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, Don't like that mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like. Scary house mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now, this house was ramshackle as fuck, and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently, before we moved in, still had a working, ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and caused a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young, broke parents got a cheap rent agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked a hundred percent. I know all this because I heard stories about the shitty farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry, and I was rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going apeshit from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards to the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running towards my mom, then turning and running back towards the pond, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off towards the water full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I got into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside. Victor asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door, and one at the top of the stairs. 
The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while cooking. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, boss starts going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor is sleeping. Every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what the hell he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off towards the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around, and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a bit before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grisly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering the cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was here, how I got there, and other questions like that. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said I told her, with that serious look only a small child can give, that the children brought me here, shitting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me. She demanded to know what children, and where the hell they are now. I looked at her dead serious, and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, and that I didn't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said, as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said this same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me, so she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, and in this place in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever the fuck those things were, I really don't think they were children.
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdo, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruiz, Annalisa Petri, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.